everyone there. Nice to meet you. My name is Buzz. I'm from Stuart Park Islam and uh, I'm a former student at the University of Bradford as well. I think people have still heard of my legend from the time of uni. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever you've heard, it's not true. All right. Okay. Um, the reason we're doing uh, animal rights, especially if we concentrate on the Islamic perspective of animal rights as well, is for three reasons. The first reason is it's part of our religion. And I know there's some non-Muslims in the crowd today, but basically we take our sources from the Quran, which we believe is to be the word of God, and the Hadith or Sunnah, which are the teachings and traditions of our Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. And as part of our religion, we also believe that... Am I in the camera now? Let's stop. Yeah, right. So, uh, as part of our religion, it's important for us to practice the teachings of the Prophet, peace be upon him. Because the more we practice the teachings of the Prophet, the more Allah rewards us and the, the stronger we become as a community. And the further we stray away from the example of the Prophet, the, we, the weaker we become as a nation. And animal rights is something that the Prophet, peace be upon him, promoted 1,400 years ago amongst his own community. But for whatever reasons, it's something that, as a community, we began to neglect and move away from. Part of the reason could be that a lot of us come from like third world countries or poor countries. And we've got you know family back at home that needs money or natural disasters or famine or whatever and we think oh, well, why should I care about animal charities? I've got more important things to worry about. But today I'm going to show you why you should actually care about animal rights as well as I'm not saying instead of, but as well as. Uh, the second reason as well is within the wider community, not just the Muslim community, but within the wider community, with with the credit crunch and everything taking place, a lot of people have got less money to donate, less time to be charitable with. Uh, a lot of people have started, who had pets from before, they started giving their pets away to like uh, animal shelters because they can't afford to look after them anymore. And a lot of people have begun like to get concerned with other things and animal rights is again beginning to get neglected. So that's two reasons why we're going to go through animal rights today. I'm going to split my talk into two parts. The first part, I'm going to concentrate on the importance of animal rights, especially from the Islamic perspective. And then the second part, I'm going to go through exa examples of animal mistreatment that takes place, and then we're going to discuss what we can do as people to help improve the situation of animal welfare. Because we don't, we don't want to just listen and think, oh, that was nice, that was all brilliant, nice one, and then go home and don't do anything about it. You know, with like, when you watch Comic Relief or whatever, you see some African kids on TV and you think, oh, and then next day you forgot about it. Do you know what I mean? So what we want to do is this time is do something that we can learn from and actually practice something to take away with us and actually practice and do something about it to improve the situation for animal welfare. Okay? I didn't just put that up to try and be funny. That's the reason why I put that up there. All right? So if this is the first part. We're going to go through animal rights from the Islamic perspective. Right? And then when we go into the second part, we're going to build upon it. So just, just to remind you, everything that I'm going to say, every proof and evidence I'm going to get, is either going to be from the Quran or the Sunnah. I'm not going to make anything up off the top of my head. So I'm telling you now, especially, especially the Muslims in the, in the, in the, the listening in the audience, this is what your religion is teaching you to do. Okay, so if you neglect what I'm telling you from now onwards, you're actually neglecting a part of your own religion. Okay. So before we get into it, let's talk about the importance of animal rights. In the Quran, uh, Surah 21, verse 107, it says, And we have sent you, O Muhammad, not but as a mercy for the Alameen. Now the word Alameen, Alam means world. So Alameen is everything that dwells within the world. Whether that's humans, animals, every, everything on earth. So the Prophet, peace be upon him, he wasn't just sent as a mercy to mankind, but he was also sent as a mercy to animals as well. So therefore, there are consequences for our actions towards animals, both good and bad. So if we do something good, we get rewarded for it. If we do something bad, we get punished for it. In Bukhari, Bukhari is a, a scholar who collected a hadiths or teachings of the Prophet and he put them in a collection called, named after himself. So, uh, a Sahabi, the companion of the Prophet known as Abu Huraira, he said that the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, said that at the time of the Bani Israel, there was a prostitute 
So very naughty girl, basically. Yeah. <laughs> and she was forgiven by Allah. Look at how great her sin was. But she was forgiven by Allah because when she was passing by a panting dog, he was near the well, but he couldn't get into the well. So near well, there's always like little plants. So he's actually biting at the roots of the plants and licking them up to try and get some moisture because he was dying from thirst. So what she did is she took off her shoe. She got into, she tied, she tied her head cover onto the shoe. She put her shoe down the well, got some water out. And she gave the, the dog water to drink and saved his life. So because of that, Allah forgave her her sins. Now, the key word in that sentence is because. Because what it means is that as a direct result of giving the dog some water to drink, Allah forgave her for, for her prostitution. Do you see what I mean? Without the word because, you can say, okay, this was one thing, but she did other things as well. And, you know, overall, Allah forgave her for it. But actually, if you read the context of the hadith, it's because of this specific act of mercy towards an animal, that Allah forgave her for her major sin of prostitution. And he guided her and she, she entered into heaven. Now, how many, how many people in this crowd, like, you know, from the Muslims, I can say, I'm confident that I'm 100% sure I'm guaranteed heaven. None of us can. And yet she was a prostitute, and there's a hadith telling you that she's, she's going to heaven. Basically, so subhanAllah. See, I mean, so it, it goes to show you that when you do something good for animals, you might think, oh, I just said that. You might think, oh, it's not important, it's only an animal, why should I care? Actually, you should care because no matter how great your sins are, just by showing a little bit of kindness, a little bit, all she did was give him a drink of water, and I can forgive your sins because of that. So we know that paradise can be attained by treating animals well, but what if you do the opposite? What if you treat animals badly? Again in Bukhari, this time narrated by Abdullah ibn Omar, the Prophet, peace be upon him, said that there was a lady that was punished because of a cat which she had, and she imprisoned it until it, till it died. So she had a, a pet cat, and she neglected it, basically. She kept it imprisoned, and she didn't feed it, she didn't give it any water to drink, nor did she just say, okay, well, I don't want it as a pet anymore, I'll just release it, and then it can go hunt its own food or find its own water. She kept it under her care and neglected it, and it died because of the neglect. And again, the key word is because, because of what she did to that cat, she entered hellfire. Okay, so it wasn't because of, uh, it wasn't because she was doing so many bad things that she entered hellfire. It's specifically for this act. So she could have been like all right and everything else, but because she taught, indirectly tortured one of God's creatures and allowed, through neglect allowed it to die from starvation and thirst, she entered into hell just because of that. So there you have it guys, basically to summarize, the, the difference between heaven and hell can rest on your treatment for animals. And in a similar, similar story to the one that I mentioned about the prostitute, there was again another person, this time a man, who went to drink from a well, but this well it didn't have like a basket. No, normally it's like a basket that you lower into, into the well to drink from. But this one was broken, so he had to actually climb into the well himself to drink. And then when he came out, he saw a, deg, a, a dog that was suffering from the same thirst that he was. So he went back down, and he came back out with some water, and he gave the dog water to drink, and he entered into heaven because of that. So the people who heard this story, they said to the Prophet, O oh, Allah's Apostle, is there a reward for us in serving the animals? He said, yes, there is a reward for serving any living being. So if, if we serve the animals, there is a reward in it. Okay. Now we're going to talk about, in the second part of the talk, we're going to talk a little bit about animal mistreatment and things that uh, animals are suffering from and what we can do to help. Can anyone tell me what's the number one reason for animals being killed? What's the, what's the, main, what's the main cause for animals being killed? And, and species being lost. Hands up, anyone? Anyway. Begin. Did you have your hand up? Yeah, what's the answer? Food. To eat them. To eat the animals. Maybe, but there's actually what another one, yeah? Destroying the habitat. Destroying the habitat, yeah. Every single year, if, if you take all the, like, the, 
the protected, you know, all the protected parks in the UK. If you combine all of them together, every year because of deforestation, an area that size, so like almost the size of Wales, gets destroyed because of deforestation. Either either for farming or because of natural causes or because people like want the wood or whatever or expansion where people want to expand cities to build homes for people, things like that. And that's actually caused more species to get extinct than any other cause. Because food was a good answer, but with food, with farming and things like that, normally farmers tend to protect the species that's being farmed from going extinct, or from too many of them dying out at the same time. Because it's in their interest to maintain that species' existence, otherwise they're going to go bust, see what I mean? But there's actually a lot of species that became extinct before we even discovered them because of deforestation. Let's have a look at what Baba Islam says. The Prophet, peace be upon him, narrated by Enes bin Malik. He said that if any Muslim plants any plant and a human being or an animal eats from it, he will be rewarded as if he had given that much in charity. So if we plant trees or grow plants, or even just help sustain forests, any living being that benefits from that, even if it's an animal, even if it's just a bird pecking something or eating something from that tree, we would be rewarded for it as if we gave something in charity. Now let's say that you paid a small amount of money to a charity that would plant, you know some, some charities that say we plant trees in certain areas, if you donate this much we'll plant a tree or, you know, under your name or whatever. <coughs> If you plant that tree, some trees live for hundreds of years. Every single time any living being benefits from it, you're getting a continuous running charity on your, on your behalf. So even after you've died, you're still getting rewarded by Allah for the charity that you've given from that tree. Sadaq Ajaria, basically. And it says any benefit... A lot of the scholars have said any benefit, not just eating. So think about the benefits that the forests give us with uh, protect us from global warming. One of the main, uh, according to Greenpeace, deforestation causes more global warming than all of the traffic from cars, trains, aeroplanes, and all of the cows in the world put together. Because <laughs> uh, if you're saying, um, what's the most reason for uh, ozone layer being destroyed, people either say traffic or cows, right? <laughs> Actually, deforestation is more than both of them put together because the trees are essential for keeping the balance of our ozone layer. <coughs> and so just think of all the benefit that you can get from Sadaka Jerry or continuous running charity just by planting a tree or trying to prevent deforestation. So now we know what's so important, why it's important for us to care for animals. But what are, what are the duties, like what should we be doing towards God, caring for animals? What are the duties of a Muslim? So Allah says in the Quran, Surah Al-An'am, verse 38, There is no animal walking on the earth, nor a bird flying on its two wings, except that they are part of communities like you. Now when you read the tafsir of Ibn Kathir, what it says is it doesn't necessarily mean that all animals live in communities, like some animals live individually, some live. What it means is every species of animal is considered a community in the same way that humans are considered a community. So the birds, they're considered an ummah in the same way, to use the Islamic term, as humans are considered an ummah, so on and so forth. And he also says in Surah Al-Isra, verse 44, The seven heavens and the earth and all that is in it proclaim Allah's praise. There is not a thing but proclaims Allah's praise it's just that you don't understand how they glorify Allah. So even the animals, they glorify Allah. Now what does that mean? And what, the, what does that result in for human beings? If you go to the tafsir, means exegesis or explanation of the Quran. And Ibn Kathir is one of the most famous scholars on tafsir. He said well, that what this means is every single created being celebrates the praises of Allah but mankind doesn't understand them because either it's not in the same way that we do it or not the same language or whatever the reason may be and Imam Ahmad he said that Mu'ad ibn Anas said that the Messenger of Allah came to some people who were sitting on some horses right? 
So there were people that were just sitting on horses and they were talking to each other while sitting on horseback. And the Prophet, peace be upon him, told them off. He said, drive them safely and then leave them safely. Don't use horses like a chair. They're not chairs for you to have conversations on in the streets and the marketplaces. Because the one that is ridden, in other words, the horse, may be better than the person who is riding it. Because the horse might be remembering Allah, might be praising Allah's, maybe praising Allah more than the person. Doing. So it goes to show the respect that Islam shows towards animals. And they're Arabian horses, by the way. <laughs> Best looking horses in the world. So as we've seen from the previous slide, uh, Muslims aren't only just to use animals for work. We're only supposed to be using animals for work when necessary. It is permissible to use them for work. It's like ride on or to plow the field or whatever. But you're only supposed to use them for that when necessary. And they're not to be considered as tools or objects. I can just treat them however I want. And uh, as a result, you're not allowed to over overburden an animal with too much work. Like that naughty guy just done in the picture there. Right. The Prophet, peace be upon him, said, All blind men of God, fear God and use the animals to the capacity, but do not overburden them. Feed them properly and provide them with rest before they are exhausted and tired. And that's narrated in Abu Dawood. So, in the same way, if you had a person working for you, employing him, you're not supposed to overburden him, and you're supposed to give people, you know, like work certain hours, and you're supposed to give them time to rest in between work as well. And it's the same way with, with when you use animals for work. You're not supposed to overburden them, and you have to make sure that after like, you know, a certain period of time of work, that you give them rest and you make sure they're well fed and that they're rested and everything. Now, like I said, I don't want today to be just about listening and then going through one ear and out the other. Because the Sahaba, the companions of the Prophet, and the Salaf, the righteous, the righteous predecessors, when they used to hear something from a hadith or the Quran, they didn't, use, they didn't just used to get like a spiritual boost, kind of like, yeah, Islam's great, nice one, yeah. They used to like implement it in their daily lives. And here's some example of how the Salaf used to implement the Prophet's teaching, peace be upon him, into their lives. And after the Prophet, peace be upon him, died, he was succeeded as the ruler of the Muslimin by the Khilafah system. The first Khalif was the righteous caliph was Abu Bakr al and the second one was Omar ibn al-Khattab who was a companion of the Prophet and he became the ruler of the Muslimin. And actually the, the greatest expansion of the Islamic Empire happened under Omar ibn al-Khattab's rule. And he used to he used to be famous for walking the streets and if you he, if he'd see like if you'd see anyone doing anything wrong, he'd like stop them and correct them. Or if he's seen anyone needing help, he'd go and help them himself. He wouldn't get his guards, oh, this guy's hungry, go get him. He'd go get the food himself, look after people himself. So one day, narrated by Malik, he was walking, and he, he saw a donkey, which was carry, carrying unburned bricks. He was carrying too many, and he could tell that the donkey was like, you know, like finding it difficult to carry this much. So what he did is he, he, he went up to the donkey, and he took some of the bricks off of the donkey's back, to relieve the weight that the donkey had to carry. So the owner of the donkey, seeing Omar taking the bricks off, it, off his donkey's back, so he rushed, he rushed towards Omar and said, Oh, Omar, what are you doing? Do you have an authority to do that? These aren't your bricks. It's, not, it's my donkey. It's my bricks. Like, who gives you the authority to come and take bricks off my donkey's back? And Omar answered him. He said, Well, what reason am I the ruler of the Muslims for then? It's my duty to make sure that the Muslims are practicing Islam properly. And it's his responsibility not only to look after the Muslims, but everything under the, the, rule, the rule of uh, the Islamic Caliphate. So even the animals, it's the, it's the ruler's responsibility to make sure that the animals are being cared for. And Omar took this so seriously that he used to say that he, he was afraid that if a camel died on the coast of the Euphrates, the Euphrates is in Iraq, and Omar al was based in, in, in Saudi Arabia, modern day Saudi Arabia. So it was a long distance. He was afraid that if, a, do if a, a donkey or a camel or any animal died out of negligence, even if it was so far away that he couldn't have known about it, he was afraid that Allah would hold him responsible for it. Because as the leader of the Muslims, he's responsible for the animals living in the Islamic <coughs> Kingdom as well. 
Now, look how far the Prophet, peace be upon him, planned ahead to look out for animals. Just to give you a bit of context before I go into this hadith, at the time of the Prophet, peace be upon him, the Muslims were being persecuted, even, even more so than what they are now. They got driven out of their homes from Mecca, they had to emigrate to Medina. Uh, they got boycotted, so no one was allowed to trade with them, sell them food or anything. A lot of people died from thirst and hunger. The, the Prophet's wife Khadija, anha, she died while, while the Muslims were, when the Muslims were being boycotted. Uh, a lot of Muslims got tortured to death. Wars broke out. He was in charge of looking after the community. It's not just like all problems, just you know, day-to-day -day running of the community. And on top of all that, you know, there was people from one Afghan people. Some people pretended to be Muslims so they could infiltrate the Muslim areas and they tried to actually kill the Prophet, peace be upon him. So he, there was a risk of assassination any time. And despite all of that, you know, if you had all of that on your mind, you'd normally think, you oh, are too much on my mind anymore. Despite all of that, this is how far he went to plan ahead, caring about animals. He told his companions, when you're traveling through the land, if you travel through a land that's full of like grass and pasture, travel slowly so that the animals can graze as they're traveling through the land. But when you, when you pass through an arid area, go through it quickly so that the animals don't get hungry. And then he said to them, when you pitch your tents, do not, uh, they cannot sleep at night, do not pitch your tents on beaten tracks, because these are the pathways of nocturnal creatures. SubhanAllah, look how far he went. He thought about, there are some animals that come out at night, so he told people to avoid pitching their tents in the pathways that these animals that travel at night go through, so as to not annoy these animals. That, that's how far the Prophet peace be upon him went. And that's narrated by Abu Huraira in Sahih Muslim. Finally, it's important to remember that animals have feelings. I remember, you know, in restaurants, how they cook lobsters and crabs and stuff. Yeah. Does anyone know how they cook them? Yeah. yeah. Boil them alive. <coughs> so they grab the lobster, they don't kill it or whatever, they just throw it while it's still alive into boiling water. SubhanAllah. And uh, recently they've started doing research, and the research showed that it turns out that crabs and lobsters do actually have feelings, they feel pain. Right, I'm thinking, yes, genius. I'm glad our taxes are being put to good research use. <laughs> okay. So they're starting to say whether it's still moral to do that or not. But look what the Prophet, peace be upon him, did. Uh, some of the companions were on their journey with the Prophet. And the Prophet left them for a while. And while he was gone, uh, some people got hungry, so they took the small young chicks from a, from a nest. And when their mother found out, the bird started circling above them and it was clear that the bird was distressed, like flapping its wings and crying out and everything. So the Prophet, peace be upon him, when he came and he found out what happened, he said, who has hurt the feelings of this bird by taking its young? And somebody said, I, I did it. And he told them, give them back to the bird. Give the young back to the mother. SubhanAllah. And that's narrated in Muslim. <coughs> so in Islam, we have to bear in mind that animals have feelings and we have to take these feelings into account. And again, reported in Muslim, uh, there was another time where they were travelling and there was a woman that was riding on a donkey, uh, sorry, on a camel, and the camel jerked or whatever, so the woman swore at the camel. So the Prophet, peace be upon him, he said to her, right, get off the camel and set the camel free. Don't use it for riding or for work anymore because you insulted the camel. So look at the respect. That, like, do you think the camel understood the insult? Our camel's like, oh. <laughs> I'm carrying her on my back and this is how she treats me. Yeah. The camel didn't even understand what she said. Right? The point is the respect that we have to show to animals. You see what I mean? So just because she insulted the camel, the Prophet made her get off the camel and he said, don't use it for work anymore. Let the camel be free. And that, that includes, like, you know, in America, in, in Britain it's illegal, thank God. We've got a little bit more sense than or Yankee cousins, but over there, like for sure, they like to, you know, like for Rottweilers and Dobermans, these kind of dogs, they like to, I think it's called propping the ears, is that correct? Yeah. yeah, basically they cut the ears with the puppies, so that instead of them being cute and fluffy going downwards, they're like devil ears, you know, like pointy, 
like triangle pointing upwards to make them look more intimidating. And then they cut off the tails as well, they dock the tails to make them look like more gangster, you know what I mean, bro? You know, that kind of thing, yeah. All Jesusism and chains and blah blah blah. I don't know, man. So in Islam, that's haram. Prophet peace be upon him said, do not clip the forelock of a horse, for its decency is, is attached to its forelock, not its mane, for it protects it, not its tail, for it's, its, its flip flap, fly flap. So docking tails and cropping and basically mutilating animals for the sake of fashion, Islam not allowed. Now we're going on to more controversial issues. Animals as a food source. As we all know in the media, they like to show that Muslims are all barbarians. We treat women like rubbish. Twenty the paces behind me. Do you know what I mean? And uh, we like to kill everyone. And when we eat meat, we like to kill the animal as slowly and as painfully as possible. <laughs> and all this kind of thing. So it's important that we discuss animals as a food source in Islam. How am I doing for time, by the way? Is anyone actually telling me that I'll just carry on there? <laughs> <laughs> so, in Islam, in the Quran it says, Forbidden to you is dead meat, blood, flesh of swine, and anything which has been slaughtered under the name of anything other than Allah. And you're not allowed to kill an animal by strangling or by giving it a violent blow, or anything that's been gored to death or partially eaten by a wild animal. Now the key bit I wanted to focus on here is strangling or violent blow. And so in Islam you can't kill animals violently. And, the, and you're supposed to only kill animals if there's a purpose for it, like, like for eating. So Prophet peace be upon him said, whoever kills even a little bird unnecessarily, it will complain to God on the day of judgment. And it will say, my Lord, so and so killed me in vain and did not kill me for a useful purpose. So you see people now, they go on like, for, for the sake of sport, they go hunting for the sake, not, not because they want to eat the animal, or just for the sake of fun, they go hunting and kill an animal, and you know, or they cut its head and put it on the wall, like as a, like as a, I oh, look at me, I'm so cool, I've killed an animal. So all that's haram in Islam. And when killing an animal for the purpose of food, is necessary to do it in the kindest way possible. So the Prophet, peace be upon him, he reported, uh, reported by a Muslim, he said, Allah has ordained kindness in everything. If killing is to be done, do it in the best manner. When you slaughter, do it in the best manner by first sharpening the knife and putting the animal at ease. And if you read the explanation to this hadith, a lot of the scholars have said that... You're going to pause. You're good to go, yeah? yeah? So, a lot of the scholars have said that to, before you slaughter the animal, you have to you know, give it drink, food, relax it, when you put it down, you can't just knock it down to the ground or whatever for slow. You have to put it down gently and all that kind of thing. And a person told the Prophet that when he slaughters a sheep, he shows mercy to it. And the Prophet ﷺ told him, Even a sheep, if you show mercy to it, Allah will show mercy on you. And I know there's a talk on mercy in Islam, so I don't want to cross over into the other brother's talk. But basically, as a, as a general rule in Islam, if you want Allah to show mercy to you, you have to show mercy to others, and that includes animals. Okay? Uh, and in Islam, you know, we mentioned you have to sharpen the knife. So, because you, you have to slaughter, supposedly, with one strike to, to finish the slaughter, just with one go. But you're not allowed, this is important, you're not allowed to sharpen the knife in front of the animal you're going to slaughter. The Prophet, peace be upon him, once saw a man sharpening the knife in front of a sheep that he laid down to be slaughtered. And the Prophet told him off and he said, do you intend to make it die two deaths? Why did you not sharpen the knife before laying it down? And what the scholars have explained this at is two deaths means that your animals aren't stupid. Like if you're sharpening a knife in front of it, he knows what's coming. <laughs> so you're making it die twice, one out of fear from the knife, and the second time when you slaughter it. Now, let's bear this in mind. If you're not allowed to sharpen the knife, in front of the animal. Do you think you're allowed to kill an animal in front of another animal? No. Now, who knows how people slaughter animals in the UK? Any, 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 doesn't matter who it is, all of them do the same thing. 
production line. Production line. Yeah? So there'd be like a, a conveyor belt, the animals are on the conveyor belt, and there'd be like a, like a machine, like for chickens, they have the Marlow conveyor belt, and there's a machine that goes around and cuts the heads off as, as the chickens go past. So the chickens are stood in a line, and they can see all the chickens before them, getting the, getting the heads chopped off, and he knows that it's, it's, it's my turn next. You see what I mean? And that, that includes like, because we have to be honest, that includes like halal meat as well. See what I mean? So, halal, halal you, have to, you have to slaughter and you have to say, you know, the kalim on it in, in God's name. That makes it halal to consume. But just because it's halal to consume doesn't mean that the person who did it isn't committing a sin. It's, it's, it's not halal to be killing animals in front of each other and sharpening knives in front of each other. See what I mean? So I'm going to get more into that later on. And not only should it be slaughtered humanely, but it should be led, when you lead it, like you know when you take it from the farm to the slaughterhouse, you should lead it with dignity and kindness as well. Omar, remember Omar ibn al-Khattab, the caliph of the Muslims, he saw a man dragging the sheep by its legs to be slaughtered, and he said, woe to you, lead it to its death in a decent manner. And for, for those of you who know Omar al-Khattab's personality as well, according to other sources, he battled him for it. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, oh, you're like dragging by the legs, do you? <laughs> <laughs> so, and also, it's not permissible to shoot animals that have been tied. And obviously, shoot here means with a bow and arrow, because from this point of view, yeah. So, narrated by Hisham bin, Z bin Zaid, um, the Prophet, peace be upon him, forbade the shooting of tied or confined animals. Now I know there's a big debate about stunning, like stunning animals before. To be fair, most research shows that by stunning an animal before you slaughter it, it reduces the pain that the animal feels. There is some research, like there was research in Germany that they carried out uh, a brain scan, because a lot of people carry out a scan on the heart, but this time they carried out on a, on a brain scan, and it actually showed that the process of stunning can sometimes hurt more than slaughter. So there's a bit of a difference, but the vast majority of research shows that by stunning it reduces the pain. And now, most Muslims think that stunning is haram, but it isn't. Uh, according to fatwa issued by the Legend of Daitama in Saudi Arabia, the permanent committee of scholars in Saudi Arabia, what is actually haram is to kill an animal by stunning. So if the stun kills the animal, that's haram, because it comes under the category of dariba. So if you go back to the previous verse, that talks about you're not allowed to kill an animal by a violent blow, that would make it haram. But if the stun doesn't kill the animal, and it's the slaughter that kills the animal, the stun just reduces the pain, then that is actually allowed. So I'm not saying you have to stun the animals, like both are allowed, with or without. See what I mean? But the emphasis in Islam is to reduce the pain as much as possible. And the stunning is a te technological <coughs> advancement. Electricity is a technological advancement. So, it wasn't available at the time of the Prophet, peace be upon him. At the time of the Prophet, they didn't have electricity, so they, they didn't have the facility to reduce the pain in this way. If you look at the emphasis of the Prophet's teachings, they're all geared towards reducing pain as much as possible. Okay? So, so long as the animal isn't killed by the stone, then it is allowed in Islam. Some scholars have said that with small animals like chickens, like with cows and sheep, it's alright, but with chickens, a lot of the time they die from the stun. So they'll be dead before they get slaughtered. So they've said that until technology advances in a way where they've got the right amount of electricity to stun the animal without killing it, it's best to avoid consuming chicken that's been stunned because you don't know which one died from the slaughter and which one died by stunning, if you see what I mean. <coughs> So it looks like it's mad and <laughs> So I'm, I'm going to be about another 10 minutes long too long, shall I? Uh, animals should be f treated fairly. So you're not allowed to hit animals on the face. And because of that, you'd be some, some animals, you see them like people riding the animal, it jerks or they hit the animal on the head. You see what I mean? Like, it's unbelievable. And you know like in farms, they brand the animals' faces so they can recognize which animal is which. So the result of this hadith, Ibn Omar, so the Caliph Omar, his son, he disliked the branding of animals on the face because of the hadith 
that you're not allowed to beat animals on the face. <coughs> and also, the Prophet, peace be upon him, cursed the one who did mufla to an animal. Basically, none of the Arabs. Uh, they used to, like, some of them live in desert places, so animals were scarce. So they wanted to eat animals, but they didn't want to kill the animal because, yeah, then you, like, wasted an animal. So what they used to do is, like, if you got a sheep, they'd cut off the sheep's tail and just eat its tail and keep it alive. <coughs> Or what they would do is they used to like to eat fat for some reason. I don't advise to try it, it's disgusting. But they used to like it. So what they used to do is they used to cut off the, the camel's home, which was stored with fat. They used to eat the fat and leave the animal, like the camel, alive. Because then they can still use it to ride or to use its milk or whatever. So the Prophet, peace be upon him, forbade this and he actually cursed the one that does it. Now, this is the final part of my presentation. I'm, I'm warning you in advance, some of the stuff I'm about to show you is a bit gruesome. So, if you have a problem with it, it's not my fault because I warned you. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to concentrate on battery, battery farming and fur trade. There's a lot of other topics I can talk about, but I ain't got time today. I think I've already got all of my time anyway. So, I'm going to show you uh, two short videos and then we're going to discuss them as we go along. So first I'm going to show you a video on battery farming. Hopefully you can ask if it's worked out and actually test it out. I think it was this one. Is there sound on guys? Is it there's a blue point flashing saying audio mute? I'm just getting it. There's a cage. When you wake up in the morning, what's the first thing you see? What if it was a cage? What if every morning it was a cage? It takes a hen like this one up to 30 long hours in a battery cage to produce just one egg. This is the true cost of cage eggs. She can't stretch her wings. She can't go outside or feel the sun on her back. One of a hen's most fundamental desires is to build a nest and lay her eggs in private. But in factory farms, they are forced to eat, sleep, and lay their eggs in a crowded cage. At hatcheries, most chicks destined for factory farms have part of their beaks cut off. Birds' beaks are filled with nerves, yet this is done without pain relief. Male chicks cannot produce eggs and do not grow fast or large enough to be raised for meat. So on their first day of life, they are gassed or dropped into grinders whilst still alive. Every year, millions of male chicks meet this fate across the entire egg industry. Ultimately, their sisters' lives are cut short too. Chickens can live up to 12 years. But from as young as 18 months of age, when their egg production wanes, hens across the egg industry are gathered up and sent to slaughter. Cage eggs have become symbolic of the suffering caused by factory farms. Tomorrow, this hen and millions like her will wake up again to life in a cage. But it's within our power to free them. If you believe in a world without factory farming, then by spreading the word... I'll do. I apologise, I didn't realise it. I realise it had such large music in it. Uh, I was listening to the bottom match at the same time, so I, I didn't realise it had loud music in the background. Uh, anyway, it gives you a general idea of what happens in egg farms. And I know a lot of times when you go to animal rights, whatever, what sometimes they do is they go to the worst possible case you know, secret recordings, they show you it and say, oh, look how evil you, you know. This isn't like a one-off case, this is the standard. 
this, this isn't like a really bad one-off one that I've brought and showed you as like, oh look, I'm, I'm, I'm not painting them all. This, this is the standard normal of how it happens. Okay, with battery farming, it's called battery farming because the cells are called batteries. And what happens is, again, what they didn't show you in the video is, if you bring a person and he doesn't move his muscles and you just keep him confined, the muscles begin to waste due to a lack of usage. So a lot of these chickens actually, the they begin to like the muscles begin to like rot and waste while they're still alive slowly, like degenerate while in the cells. See what I mean? So I mean, who can think of a way where we can avoid valley farming from happening? Has anyone got any ideas? By free range eggs. Free range eggs. Yeah. Consume less meat. Consume less meat than the one. Anyone else? Okay, you want to. <laughs> okay. Basically, the best way of doing it is, as brother mentioned, is free-range eggs. Okay. Well, some people say I can't afford them. You see, this is where what the sister said comes in. Who's heard of the horse meat scandal? <laughs> Everyone. Right. Now, technically, Islamically, you are allowed to eat horses. We were discussing this in the car. Uh, the point isn't about whether eating horse or cow. It's, we're not talking about, ah, oh, the animal's so cute, how can you eat him? Oh, you can eat him, though, he's not cute. But that's not, that's not what the topic is. The point is, he's selling you it as beef, but it's horse. Which means, he doesn't care about fraud or about rights or... All he cares about is, what's the cheapest cost for me, what's going to make me the most money, right? Now, if he doesn't care about that, what makes you think he's going to care about anything else, like welfare of animals or what health hazard it has on the people consuming it? Some of those horses were taking drugs for, you know, medications for horses, which are okay for horses, but if we consume them, they could kill us. See what I mean? And they were only found in the cheap stuff. See what I mean? So, what you could do is eat less, but pay for the more expensive stuff. So instead of, you know, eating, say, once every two or three days and buying the stuff for one pound, buy the thing for two pound and just eat once a week the meat instead. You see what I mean? Like, you can eat more than once a week. I don't know <laughs> So it's better to buy the more expensive. It's better for you from a health perspective, right? There's going to be more good stuff in there. It's better for animal welfare. Free range eggs means that chickens, instead of being put in a cell, they're actually allowed to be inside like a field area where they can move about and do whatever chickens do. There's not a lot to be honest with you. You know what I mean? So it's. Why, sorry, why did they cut their beaks? I don't understand that. I have no idea. They, they peck. Because the problem is when they're put closely together, they peck each other and cause damage and kill, kill each other. And that's, that's why they have a vice yeah. education. <laughs> it's because apparently they, like, because they're so cramped within each other. They attack each other so they can like, attack each other. So they cut them off so they don't attack each other. Some people say that it's because they, they go crazy from the, from the lack of tight space that they peck each other. Yeah, probably is that. Right. But, but hen pecking, it even happens in free range systems as well. Yeah. So it is a big issue. It's a behaviour that yeah. chickens have when they live together. Yeah. We, we talked about a hen pecked husband. Yeah. Is a yeah. <laughs> some, some of the stuff that gets put under free range, some of the things that gets put under free range, it's like. Instead of being, it's like in a massive, what's it called, hot, not hot. Barn, is it barn? That's the one, barn. Yeah. Yeah. You just put them like in a massive barn, and then the label is free range. See what I mean? Like, so, there's a lot more details you could get into, but I just, just for a short bit of time. Um, so next video is the fur trade. This one's disgusting, and it might come across as slightly racist, but I'll get that like there. Abbots raised for their fur in China and not protected by a single law and they are killed in ways that would shock unsuspecting consumers in the countries where their fur is sold. Since Western consumers are buying the fur, it's our refiner pulling animals from their cages, throwing them to the ground, burgeoning them with metal rods and stomping on them. Some workers swing animals by their hind legs, smashing their heads into the ground, which breaks the animals' necks or backs, but leaves them fully conscious for the skinning process. 
time after time, animals are found panting and blinking as they are skinned alive. Some of the animals' hearts are still beating as long as 10 minutes after they've been skinned. To buy a coat with fur trim. And don't be deceived by labels, since raw fur pelts often move through international auctions before being sewn in other countries. Fur from China may also end up on a final product that says made in Italy or made in France. I said it might be slightly racist. Now, see, the thing is, there's a reason why they skin them alive. It's not just because they're Chinese. There's another reason as well. Um, who can think of why they skin animals alive? It's easier. So it's not easier. easier. It's easy it's to better skin. Better for the fur. Better for the fur. If you, if you get skin them alive, they're dead. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> Basically, when an animal dies, I think, I think the scientific term is metastasis. I'll check it when I go home. If it doesn't, I'll take it out and yeah. pretend that I knew the answer. But anyway, I think it's metastasis where when you die, your body loses elasticity and it begins to harden. So if they kill the animal and then try and pull its fur off, it won't be the same quality and it might even get damaged. So they keep them alive to keep the best quality fur possible. Now, why they don't kill them after they've skinned them? Did you, in the video, even after they'd skinned them, instead of killing them, they just threw them in a hump and let them die slowly. And why they did that, that's just nastiness. But this doesn't just happen in China. This happens everywhere, okay? And um, even in Western countries, it happens as well. Okay, we can't say that every single person that's skinned, we can't say all fur comes from that. It happens everywhere across the world. So if you are gonna buy fur, make sure you buy it from a company, like, you know, from a company where you know exactly where the source is coming from and they can guarantee you that the animal's been killed before it's been used for its fur. And from an Islamic perspective, you have to be careful which animal it comes from because a lot of scholars have said it's not permissible to kill an animal just for, like, a, to adorn yourself. So, like, sheep, if you're going to eat it and then use it, that's fine. But to kill it just for the purpose of adorning yourself, a lot of scholars have said this isn't allowed either. So that's my time, and I've gone over my time. I don't know how much bikes I did time myself, but I went over my time by a lot. I apologise for that. Uh, thanks a lot for listening. If anyone's got any questions or anything, what we're going to be doing today is instead of having a Q&A section, is we're going to have a stall area just in the room next door. Uh, you'll have an opportunity to ask your direct questions directly one-to-one -one with the speakers or with anybody from Straight Path Islam or the ISOC. So what we want is one-to-one -one interaction with people, because I find that by one-to-one -one interaction and talking to each other, we can get more out of it than just a 30-second question and a 30-second answer. Okay? So I hope to see some of you guys at the start after this. Thanks for listening. Thank you very much. Thank Well, first of all, I would like to thank you for inviting me here this evening. The RSPCA is really keen to talk with many different cultures and people that we don't normally get to an opportunity to speak with. Um, I'm working with an organisation, in fact, called um, First Ethical, who are working with a range of charities on different issues, and animal welfare is one of the issues that they've chosen to, to look at, and they're working closely with the RSPCA. A little bit about myself, I'm actually from their education team and my role actually is usually talking to student teachers who are going to go into schools and so my role is showing how animal welfare education can fit to science, it can fit to citizenship, personal, social and health education. So this is a great opportunity to talk to students who come from across a range of disciplines. So I guess many of you scientists here, are you uh, training to be scientists? Can you give me a show of hands, how many science? Biologists, any people who are doing studying biology? There's a few there as well, yeah? And I guess then the whole range from business, engineering, economics as well. So, a different audience that I normally speak, speak to. Right, the RSPCA. You can see here its, its mission statement. It's to, to work for a world in which all humans respect and live in harmony with all other members of the animal kingdom. So immediately you'll see a lot of links between what Basil was talking about and what the RSPCA is trying to achieve. 
important right away to say that it's an animal welfare organisation. It's not rights. It's not saying that animals have rights that must be followed. It's saying that people have a responsibility for animal welfare. We believe that people should be responsible. Part of my education work is to get young people to be informed, responsible and active, doing things positively for animals. That's what we're trying to encourage young citizens to be. And the other thing we want them to be is we want them to grow up to be what we call compassionate consumers. We want them to understand what they're buying, when they're buying eggs, when they're buying food, if they're thinking about what clothes they should be wearing and whether fur is acceptable. We want them to be compassionate. It's, it's very easy, I think, to do shock tactics. And then it's, it, I talk a lot with our research scientists and they want young people to go into science and be compassionate scientists. We do still have to test on animals, and while that's the case, although we're trying to replace, reduce and refine, while we still have to test on animals, it's important that they're compassionate and we're not allowing unnecessary suffering to take place. So, the Royal Society for the Prevention of Cruelty Animals is first of all a charity. It's not a government organisation, <coughs> we're often seen to be something linked to the police, that's not the case. We are a charity, we rely entirely on the generosity of the public who gives their legacies, who fundraise for us. 1824 we were formed, a long time ago now. That is in fact five years before the Metropolitan Police. Um, it's, uh, it was an important time and we're just about to celebrate in 12 years our 200th anniversary. So we're working now on a 12 year strategy that will take us up to that 200th birthday and trying to think, well, what sort of world do we want to be in 12 years time? How do we want people to think about animals? What do we want to have changed? And I'll talk about some of the pledges that we're bringing in a bit later. It was founded back in 1824 by Richard Martin, who's here, he was an MP, by William Wilberforce. Now you might know the, the name William Wilberforce. He was involved in the abolition of slavery Having successfully achieved that across the British Empire, he then looked at what is the next thing, what is the next problem that humans are facing, and he felt it was cruelty to animals. And in fact, the RSPCA is a charity because it improves the human condition. This is something that fascinates me always. Animal rights is not charitable. You cannot be a charity if you try and just push animal rights. But because being kind to animals understanding their suffering and thinking about their needs improves us as people, that's why it can be a charity. Charity must be for the benefit of humans, that's the only way you can be a charity in the UK, and we benefit humans, which I quite think is an interesting idea. So we've been helping animals now for 188 years. We were the first official animal welfare charity, and in fact, many of you may have heard of the NSPCC, which is the charity that looks after children. That started off as a subcommittee of the RSPCA, and then separated off as a separate charity. Now at the time, of course, when the RSPCA was formed, the problems that we had in England were very different from the ones that the RSPCA thinks about today. Animal baiting, bear baiting was common, bullfighting was common in England. It was a key problem. <coughs> Some images from the time. Cockfighting was another thing that was very common, people betting on this. And, of course, it was the beast of burden. It was horses and donkeys were also out on the streets. They were the main form of transport. They were the main motive power before the engine, the petrol engine, was invented. And so horses and donkeys, that was very much the, the, the bread and butter, if you like, of the RSPCA. And our inspectors, the first ones, were actually working in um, Smithfield Market in London, looking at cattle. And they were given a uniform, and it, the police actually copied the idea from the RSPCA of the uniform. So there you see, animal markets, as I've just said, were another important part of what we did. And of course at the time, down in the pits, getting coal out with the Industrial Revolution, it was pit ponies and canaries there to check to make sure that there was no dangerous gas. So animals were involved very much in the industry of the time. So, animals used by humans in lots of different ways. In 1914, there was the Great War, and the RSPCA was very much involved with the Royal Veterinary Corps, helping to assist animals there. And you can see here, um, um, fundraising there for animals used in the Great War. Today's RSPCA is very different. We're still working to improve the lives of animals across England and Wales. 
And the main way we do that is through the role that you can see here, the inspector. Our inspectors, there are about 400 of them across all of England and Wales, so we're nothing like a police force in any way. We're involved in rescues. There's been lots of floods over the last couple of years. And again, helping animals there. Finding new homes for animals is another key part of what we do. So around 60,000 animals every year are rehomed from our centres to new loving homes. So lots of animals. One of the big problems we have in this country is overpopulation. The RSPCA believe that you should be neutering your pets, you should be neutering um, animals so that there's not this huge number that can't find homes successfully. Today's RSPCA also has clinics and hospitals. Our hospitals now very much support our inspectors, so they're for animals that have been mistreated and need immediate veterinary care. And we've got um, 10 hospitals across England and Wales. We do a lot of lobbying as well in government. This is Gavin Grant, who's our chief executive. Um, trying to change legislation, that's something that we've been trying to do since 1824. The first action plan said that we should have legislation that protects animals, and the best act came in 1911, and then the more recent one was 2006, the Animal Welfare Act, and I'll talk about that in more detail. The Welsh Government as well is very keen, because it's a more rural economy, is better at actually protecting and looking after animals. So we also provide help with our international department, and um, this is an example of the RSPCA in a box. We um, send boxes to different countries across the world so that they can set up veterinary support and veterinary help. We also have the Freedom Food Scheme, which is about approving high welfare foods. And this is setting standards for different species all the way from birth through to slaughter. So this is the way that you can be sure that standards are kept up. And what we would say is that standards we have currently in farming aren't good enough. But this is a standard that farmers can start working towards and then we can improve the standards again and again, ensuring that animals meet their needs. <coughs> so today's RSPCA is also about campaigning. Um, one of the interesting ones that I always find is that, uh, that the rabbit has a very poor life in this country, often kept in very small cages at the bottom of gardens. The RSPCA has four areas of concern. It is pet animals, wildlife, research animals and farm animals. Now the rabbit as a species is a very interesting example because it actually fits into all four of those areas. It's a pet, you can see them in the wild where they suffer from myxomatosis and have been seen as pests at certain times. It was a farm animal and it is still eaten sometimes and it's also one of the species that often used in research and testing as well. The interesting thing about the, the pet and the way that we think about it, and it is kept in small cages at the bottom of the garden, this actually dates back to the wartime when it was a supplement to the food. And the pets, would, the animals, would only be kept there for a couple of weeks. They would be fattened and then put into the pot. So that our attitudes didn't change after the war when they became pets and people were keeping them because they liked having them as companion animals, as pets for children. And we didn't change the thinking involved that it would have been okay for just two weeks, but for a lifetime, being trapped in a small cage is not acceptable. The animal's not able to meet its needs. The badger cull. This is a key problem for the RSPC at the moment. You'll know that tuberculosis in dairy cattle is a, is a key problem. Um, and it's seen that the badger is one of the spreaders, spreads the disease, although it's not been proven exactly how the link between dairy cows and the badger comes about. The RSPCA is caught in an interesting situation here. We don't want to see a mass cull of badgers, but on the other hand, we care about the welfare of the dairy cow as well. So it's important that we get that balance between those two areas. A duck to water. Believe it or believe it not, at the moment it's not required that a duck has access to water when it's a farmed duck. So what we're trying to do is introduce standards and looking at the way that ducks can have access to water when they're being farmed in large numbers. Puppy, again, we have a lots of, um, we've got a very good website that uh, you should go, I'd recommend you go and have a look at at the end of uh, this session, where there's lots of different ways of trying to learn about how to be a responsible pet owner. A series of other ones would be um, animals in circuses, wild animals being kept in circuses. Again, it's impossible for an animal to meet their needs, and I'll talk about what the five needs are that are in the Animal Welfare Act, 
and also animals in um, zoos and animals in circuses. Yes, and always check packaging. One of the things that we're always campaigning for is meat is clearly labelled. Where has it come from? That's something that is very important. And the, the horse issue at the moment has really brought this about. People aren't trusting of the labels. If it says beef, how come there's horse or pig sometimes in it as well? So today's RSPCA, we are about trying to change people's attitudes. We want compassionate citizens. So we provide and produce resources for schools as I've said, in science, in citizenship, so that we train teachers to deliver animal welfare education. Today's RSPCA, we also have a press department. It's important that we get these messages out through the news, through the media, through television, and it's a key part of what we do. I've mentioned this already. There are four areas of concern, four groups of animals that we think about. The first one, and we talk about companions. Why, why do we keep animals? Well, we want them for friendship. They enrich our lives, they make us more healthy, it's been proved. So pets, dogs, and rabbits, and cats as well. Did you know that there's a roughly eight million dogs kept in this country, eight million cats, and there's one million rabbits in the UK as well. So it's very common, about 60% of households have pets of some description. Wild animals, we've already mentioned badgers, owls, and circus animals also comes under this. Wild animals that are being kept in circuses or in zoos. Here, we mentioned it, it was mentioned by Basil in the previous presentation, it's about protection of habitat. We encourage schools to develop wildlife areas. We think it's much more valuable to observe animals behaving naturally than it is to take them out of their natural environment and keep them in the classroom or keep them in the lab. It's estimated that every year about 50,000 badgers are killed on the road. So that's going to be you know, just the same issue as if we're now culling them as well. As a species, they are going to suffer. Farm animals, pigs, cows, chickens, we've talked about all these, and, sh and sheep as well. More than nine, it's 900 million, it's a staggering number of animals that are raised in the UK each year, and 850 million of those are in fact chickens. Chickens being kept in battery conditions like you saw. And animals used in research, this is a very difficult subject for the RSPCA. It's estimated more than 100 million animals are used in experiments across the world each year. Now in the UK we have very strict legislation about how the animals are kept. We're encouraging labs to improve the enrichment of animals, to keep them in group housing rather than just on their own in an isolated way. Um, but the problems are that this is an international, international research, and so it's going on in China and America where the legislation isn't the same. So we are trying to work on an international level to change people's attitudes, to get them thinking about what the needs of animals are. <coughs> Now these are the five basic needs, and they're in the 2006 Animal Welfare Act. It's against the law if you do not provide animals with these needs. The first one, obviously, a suitable diet and regular access to water. A suitable environment where they can live, ensuring that they have bedding, that they have um, the ability to move away and find somewhere quiet to be housed either with, with company, many animals do require company, rabbits a classic example, you should be keeping more than one rabbit. Horses, horses are a key issue in this country, how many times do you go past the field and you see a horse on its own? They're actually herd animals, they would much rather, they're much happier in company. But again, you'll see many people not keeping, not keeping animals well. Certain rodents, however, are very aggressive and they are to be kept apart and certain exotic animals as well, certain lizards, the dragons, are better kept alone. The ability to behave normally and then to be protected from pain, suffering, injury and disease. This is about providing them with regular veterinary care as well. So our inspectors go out with a checklist looking at every animal where they've been reported that there is cruelty or suffering going on and they are looking for these five basic needs being met. And if a person isn't providing for these needs, then a notice is left with them, an animal welfare improvement notice, and they, a time period is given, maybe five days, the inspector will then revisit to ensure that the animal is now having all of its needs met. And if it's not, the law is being broken, and we might take that through to a prosecution. 
So the RSPCA has five pledges, things that we want to try and achieve, certainly within this 12 year period before our 12th birthday. And the key issues that we have, first of all, is overpopulation. Responsible pet owners will, new to their pets, they will microchip them. At the moment, there are something like 100,000 stray dogs in the UK. Now, the RSPCA's responsibility is not for strays, it's actually local government, the councils, the dog wardening service who should be looking after them. But if it's injured in any way, if it needs medical treatment, it's very often the RSPCA that then picks up the pieces, takes it to one of its hospitals, and then tries to rehome those animals. The, the, sorry, the five pledges are then, um, we pledge to end the euthanasia of animals. This is the killing of animals. Um, the RSPCA actually has to kill about 50,000 animals every year, which you must be amazed to think that, well, what are we doing? Many of those are wild animals. 90%, over 90% of those animals are wild. Where we do have to put down companion animals, it's because of their behavioural problems. They're not going to be successfully rehomed. And it's, I'm pleased to say that the numbers are now coming down. Last year it was only about 20 animals that we had to euthanise because um, we just didn't have anywhere to put them or any home to go to. We talked about the economic problems that are going on at the moment. And in fact, it's the horse that has really been the most um, impacted by the economic problems at the moment. Middle class families no longer able to keep a horse and having to let it go. Um, and we've got about 600 animals, 600 horses currently in RSPCA stables costing us something in the region of um, three million pounds a year to try and get these horses rehomed. It's a big problem for us. So, that's another one of our pledges. Yes, to then increase the number of animals that are reared under higher welfare systems. This is important for us as well. More animals being brought up under the animal welfare standards of freedom food. So, what you can do to help Make sure that you understand, if you're going to get a companion animal, what its needs are by doing research beforehand. This is what we always encourage young people to do in schools, is to actually find out how will your animal be healthy and happy. Find out before you get it so that you know the needs you're going to need to give it to it. Rather than going to a breeder, you might have heard about puppy farms, many of them in Wales or in Ireland now, where they import large numbers. Um, very often uh, they breed many, many litters, one after the other, and this is a big problem. So think about rehoming from one of the RSPCA or one of the other animal welfare charities like the Dogs Trust or Cats Protection. They will always have many, many animals. As soon as we build a new cattery, it's immediately full. It's a big problem. And getting your pet neutered and microchipped so it's possible to reunite you with a dog or a cat if it, if it goes missing, that's important too and learning about your pet's needs. Welfare is about the individual animal. Um, you've got uh, an interesting range of ideas from animal rights through conservation, where you're looking about the species, and it was mentioned with the food animals, obviously those species are gonna be protected. Although sometimes, of course, they're genetically manipulated. Cows, particularly in chickens, especially bred, you know, there's this genetic breeding that now goes on to try and get them healthier and uh, more meat or more milk, however that might be. And that genetic manipulation is something that does cause welfare problems. Sorry to interrupt you, just mm. on the microchipping, what's that? Sorry. Oh right, so microchipping is actually where um, it's about the size of a grain of rice. A small computer chip is put into the back of a dog's neck or, it can, or a cat's neck and then it can be scanned. And on the microchip is the actual address details and the name of the person who owns the animal. So it's much better than having a collar with a tag which can go missing you know, with an, a telephone number on it. So it has all the details of the owner. So um, it, it's done with birds where it can be put under the wing. It's done with the dog and also with the cat. It will become law for dogs. It's coming, going to become law in 2016 that if you have a dog, it needs to be microchipped. Yeah. Yeah, thank you for asking. Sorry. I'd, you, yes, microchipping and neutering are two of the key elements of being a responsible pet owner. So, what can you do to help with wildlife? So, one of the key problems is disposing of litter carefully. You don't think about throwing just a can down or throwing down a, a bottle. That will become an, a, something attractive, something that uh, an animal will investigate. And it's amazing how many animals that we actually pick up that have been injured because of litter. 
Leaving baby animals alone, many people find fledglings, the fledgling times of year is just about to happen, and they see baby birds that seem to be completely helpless and defenceless on the ground, pick them up and take them into care. That's not a good idea. It's much better to leave fledglings where they are because very often their parents, the parent bird, isn't very far away or the parent animal isn't very far away. So every year we have a big campaign. It's, please leave fledglings alone. Please leave young animals alone. But it's amazing how many people think they're doing something good and positive for their welfare when in fact, of course, it's much better to leave the animal in the wild where its needs can be met by its parents. Encouraging a wildlife area in your own garden, leaving fields, leaving fallow, leaving parts of your garden where wild animals can actually come and you can then enjoy looking at them and watching them. And caring for the environment, that's the animal's habitat. You know, we all know about the idea of ecosystems, of food chains. It's important to try and keep those healthy. Or possibly support one of our campaigns. So what can you do to help farm animals? Well, you can look for the labels to find out how an animal has been reared. You can look for feed and food. There's the red tractor, although that really only shows you that it's been made or it's been produced in this country, in England. And also organic as well is another label that you can look for. Organic doesn't necessarily mean that its welfare has been high. To get an organic label, sometimes it means that it hasn't had veterinary medication that it might have needed for its welfare. So there is a conflict there between organic and green that you think would be positive and the actual welfare of the animal. Sometimes we would say, is no, for that animal to be healthy, it should have had veterinary treatment of some kind. Look out for labels. We've got a Simply Ask campaign. Find out where your food is coming from. Ask the question. And tell your friends and family about <coughs> Freedom Food as well. And again, support one of the campaigns. And what about research animals? What can you do for research animals? Well, again, this is about campaigning, writing to your MP to express ideas. Find out as much as you can about the price that animals pay. One of our pledges is to reduce the number of animals that actually experience substantial suffering. There's three levels that the Home Office recognise when they're actually um, experimenting on animals. And there's obviously mild, there's moderate, and substantial suffering means the animal suffers a great deal. Choose products carefully from cruelty-free uh, cruelty organisations. Again, check the labels is important. You can join the RSPCA. We've got youth membership, Animal Action Club, and there's a teenage membership as well. What else can you do to help? One of the things that the RSPCA does is has these 400 inspectors, so you can report if you're concerned about animals. There's a telephone number, 0300 1234 999, and this is the number that will go through to our control centre if you're concerned about any animals or you believe that they're suffering, and that will then mean an inspector visits, pays a visit, and checks out those five needs that I talked about. You could help us fundraise, or you could come to RSPCA events at our centres. The RSPCA has branches all across England. There's an RSPCA branch in Bradford. There's a Bradford centre. You could recycle ink jet cartridges and old mobile phones. Sell unwanted goods on eBay and give it to charity as well. It doesn't have to be the RSPCA, any of the animal welfare organisations. Or you could sponsor animals as well. This is popular as gifts now, sponsoring one of the animals in care. And our centres are always looking for unwanted gifts like towels, blankets and newspapers as well. So that's something you could consider collecting and taking to a local RSPCA branch. Thank you for listening. One of the things I did want to talk about that linked to the previous to Basil's presentation was this concept of sentience. It's something that's very important and we try and get across in a lot of our science lessons as well. Sentience is the ability of animals to actually feel pain in some way. And that sentient animal can suffer. It can also experience happiness or good welfare. It's a welfare state. And so it's important that scientists particularly respect that animals have this sentience, this ability to suffer. And that very much links to many of the religious ideas that come across many different faiths. So that's an issue. It's, it's interesting. Sentience often linked to a backbone, an animal having a backbone in a central nervous system. But the octopus became, and, and seafood also has moved across, as Basil mentioned, and is now covered by the Animal Scientific Procedures Act, so that you can't experiment on those animals without giving them some form of pain relief. 
And when you're working in schools, I don't know if any of you did this when you were at school, very often you look at insects, mini beasts and snails. And my argument is always that you should treat those animals with the same respect because you're using them as a model of life and how life processes and living things operate. And so it's important that you treat them with respect as well. The classic one is to go dipping, dipping for tadpoles, you know, and then how do you treat them? How do you place them back into their environment? Do you create the environment for them so that they experience the same, they can meet their needs within that environment by having a tray beside a, a pond or actually observing them in the pond rather than taking them away? And that's what the RSPCA does. As I've said, it's very much based on those five needs. And um, yeah, trying to prevent cruelty, promote kindness and relieve suffering. That's what we do. And I'm looking forward to talk to you if there's any questions at the end. One of the activities I've got outside looks at a whole series of ways that society uses animals. And it asks you to look at those that are, you think, acceptable. Those that may be acceptable, you might have to think about it sometimes, and those that would never be acceptable. Uh, I'd be really interested to hear what your views are when you have a look at that activity outside, the different ways that society uses animals. So thank you very much for your time. I hope that was an introduction and gave you some idea of what the RSPCA does and why it does it. بسم الله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله السلام عليكم. Translates to mean may peace be upon you all. I'm going to keep this talk fairly short, inshallah, say within five to ten minutes, and going to structure it in three sections. So first, just a brief introduction to God, or as we actually know Him, Allah. So whenever I refer to Him now, we call Him Allah. Second part of the talk, we're going to speak about how to establish a connection to Allah. And then finally, mercy in Islam. But again, the mercy in Islam is a very vast topic. It basically covers the whole religion, so we're going to condense it dramatically just in the next five minutes. So the essence of the message of Islam is to know that there is none worthy of worship except Allah, as many of us will already know. And in the Quran it mentions in Surah Al-Fatiha, which is the opening chapter, Allah says, which means you alone we worship. Now, as many of us will know and some of us won't, Allah is known through his names and attributes. So, one of the attributes which he possesses is being known as the creator, Al-Khaliq. And from this attribute, we know that he created everything. We, as Muslims, believe that he created the sun, the moon, the heavens, the earth, and everything that exists. Another one of his attributes is him being known as the sustainer. Basically, from everything that we have been given, from sugar, wheat, rice, from the basics, this attribute would be a representation of this. Now, as Muslims, we connect to Allah in this manner, and we find that either as a result of societies that we live in, or images that are portrayed in different religions, we then build an image of Allah through this. So for example, one of the images that is presented at present is, say, God having a long white beard or wearing a long white garment and little images like this affect the image that we would have as a Muslim. That's basically a brief introduction to God, a way that we connect to him, which is basically through his attributes. Now I have a question for you, which is, how do you think that we would connect to God? So think of somebody beloved to you, it may be your mother, your father, it may be a friend, it may be a family member. The first question I'd like to ask you is, how would you connect to them? So break it down for me, give me an answer. How do you think that you would connect to a family member, a friend? Talk to them, yes? Anybody else? We're talking about personality traits here. We're talking about breaking it down to this level. So anybody else? By giving gifts. Giving, yeah, giving. So that's one. Showing my kindness to them. Kindness, alhamdulillah, another one. Yeah. So basically, what we're saying is that whether you're spending time with them, whether you're showing love, whether you're showing forgiveness, whether you're showing uh, generosity, etc., etc., this is one of the ways that we connect as human beings. However, when it comes to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we can connect to Him in exactly the same manner. When it comes to His love, if we were to build up an image of Him in terms of His love, 
we build up this particular status. If it came to his mercy, if we knew him truly for how merciful he was, we would build up a relationship in this particular area, so on and so forth. When it comes to Allah's attributes, however, they're not flawed like ours. We have to understand that we're human beings. And for God to be supreme and divine, we understand that his attributes are perfect. And Allah mentions in Surah 7 verse 180, to Allah belong the most excellent names. So we know from this that Allah's names are perfect. So when Allah makes a promise, for example, in Allah Allah tells us that indeed he is with the patient. If we truly believed as Muslims that Allah was with the patient, then when it came through us going through hardships, when it comes to making commitments, etc., we'd fulfill each and every single one of those. We'd stay strong, we'd stay firm in our heart. It doesn't matter what would come our way because we'd understand that Allah is truly with the patient. Again, Allah tells us that with every hardship comes ease. So if we truly believe that as a promise to Allah, rather than believing it temporarily, if we believed it for the rest of our life, again, it would cause an effect in our heart. Just to mention one more point in this regard, one of the scholars who is known, one of the scholars of the religion, he is known as Ibn al-Qayyim al jawziyyah And he mentions that if we were to keep our heart focused upon the next life, meaning heaven, and we were to understand it as though we could see it, and we could we would see hell as though we could see it, we wouldn't give up all of the next life for a moment of passing pleasure. This is something that Ibn al-Qayyim mentions. So what we've basically gone into is a breakdown of Allah's attributes and this brings us to the third part of the three, which was the mercy of Allah. So as I mentioned earlier, this topic is extremely vast. There's so many angles that we could actually approach this from. And to this effect, it is mentioned in chapter 21, mentioned in Surah Al-Anbiya as we know it. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, And we have sent you not, but as a mercy to all the worlds. So this is something that has been told to us, the Messenger of God, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, peace and blessings be upon him has been sent to us as a mercy to all the worlds. So if we look at, for example, the verse in Baqarah about alcohol, we are told that indeed in, in small amounts of it there is goodness, there is, but we are forbidden for, it, for you it completely. And again, we would find in general character traits, so that of backbiting, we know that that can destroy a community. Again, it's been forbidden in Islam. So everything that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had brought, it came to actualize justice, actualize prosperity, peace and truth. Now, we come to another narration in Abu Dawud where the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, peace be upon him says, Allah will show mercy to those who show mercy to others. Show mercy to those on the earth, the one in the heaven will show mercy to you. Not only this, but Islam came to show mutual compassion in relation to, say, respect to the elders, in relation to mercy and tenderness to the youth and in this regard the messenger of Allah peace be upon him said sallallahu alayhi wa said whoever does not respect our elders nor show compassion to the young ones is not one of us so again we can see through the little bits that I've mentioned it's a strengthening of the nations it's a strengthening of the people it's a strengthening of everybody around into one body now there was another narration where it was mentioned the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa he went to a man he was standing in the garden of a man. And in this garden he saw a camel. When the camel saw the messenger of God, peace be upon him, it groaned and it shed tears. After groaning and shedding tears, the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, peace be upon him, he'd wiped its tears and it became calm. The messenger of God, peace be upon him, then inquired about the owner of this camel. And when the owner came, he said to him, do you not fear Allah? in this animal which Allah has placed and put in your possession and it has complained to me it has complained to me that you starve it and this was something that this man was doing so the messenger of God peace be upon him he rebuked him for this matter for this matter finally just to mention something in terms of Allah's mercy to the creation we know that Islam we are told that Allah's mercy comes first we know that when it comes to his anger, we know that his mercy comes first. We know his mercy is always first. And Abu Dhar, may Allah be pleased with him, reported that the Messenger of Allah, peace be upon him, said, Whosoever does a good deed will have reward ten times like it, and I add more. Whosoever does an evil deed will have the punishment like it, or I will forgive him. So if we have a look at this in contrast, if a person was to do a good deed, 
he wouldn't just receive one reward in relation to it. He would receive a minimum of 10. And this can be magnified to the level of 700. That's just for this one deed that a person will do. In contrast to this, a person may do a sin, may commit a sin, may do something wrong, offensive, unjust. Upon doing this wrong deed, what would he receive? He would either receive equivalent to it, or be forgiven for it. So this shows more so the love and compassion and mercy from Allah. One last hadith to mention, inshallah, and we will conclude. The Messenger of Allah, peace be upon him, sallallahu alayhi wa said, Allah has divided mercy into 100 parts. And he retained with him 99 parts and sent down to earth one part. Through this one part, creatures deal with each other with compassion. So much so that animals lift, so that, so much so that an animal lift, they may lift its hoof to protect its child. That's mentioned in Bukhari and Muslim. Now, basically, if we look at the message of Islam, we will find throughout numerous and countless examples of the mercy of Islam. If God is t telling us that his mercy comes first, then we expect to find mercy throughout the entire religion. And I show you, it's exactly what we will find. Now, we didn't have much time, so I couldn't really go into this too much. I had to rush it a little bit. But inshallah, what we'll do is, as the brother mentioned, we have the strongs outside, and inshallah, we'll um, answer any questions in relation to mercy or the animal rights and uh, the RSPCA. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdika. Ashhadu an la ilaha illa anta. Astaghfiru wa atubu ilaik.